So what is a PLC? We're going to give you everyone the benefit of the doubt here. And if you already know what a PLC is, you can fast forward or just skip ahead. What is a PLC? Programmable Logic Controller. And I'm not going to go back and go through all the history of a PLC. But basically, a PLC is a device that will process the state of input field devices against a set of instructions provided by the designer to operate output field devices. So in the processor, you have RAM, random access memory. You have machine-specific coded instructions, and you have data. The machine-specific coded instructions and data must be written and downloaded into the RAM of the processor. Otherwise, it's not going to control anything. So you're looking at a basic PLC right here. With the 800 family, you have a little bit more latitude. Yes, there's global variables, and the I.O. variables are fixed. You can't change the way they look. But all of your local variables, you can name them anything you want. And remember that a variable is a pointer that's defined as a certain data type that points to an actual literal numerical memory location in an array, a memory array. You'll never know the actual numerical location. You'll create a variable with a data type, define it as a data type, like a counter, timer, boolean, etc. And when you download, it's compiled and it converts all the stuff that you have, we'll say English, Spanish, whatever language you use, into actual numerical memory locations. You'll never see those, but they're there. So your variables are pointers that point to an actual memory location. So we have the same thing here though. Across the back plane, we collect up the input image and we store it in the global variables. Then we execute the program, changing the state of both global variables if they're outputs and local variables. And each program can read any of the global variables and only the local variables of their program. So that means program two, it can read and write to and from global variables and to and from the local variables in program two, but it cannot see and or touch anything in program one or program three. And then of course the output image is sent out. In this case, there is no real backplane because the micro 800s, um, especially the 810, you cannot expand it. Now the 820, 830, 850, and 870, you can expand the IO. So theoretically it does have a backplane even though it's kind of encapsulated in the plastic box and you can see where the modules insert on the front. This is the manual we're working with. I'm going to start in the beginning of this manual and start going through it and discussing what we had you do in the manual. Now if you don't have the manual and you want to stop, order one and use the manual or not, it doesn't matter. You can keep listening and watching and you can learn without the manual to a certain point and then it's going to become more difficult because I do not go over everything that's in the manual in the video. That would be uh, really a waste of time. So I will go through some things that are in the manual, but I'm going to elaborate, which that's typically what you get in a classroom setting is you have a textbook or a project manual, but the instructor elaborates on many things that are not in the manual and does not discuss everything that's in the manual because we're assuming that you read it. So let's get on with this. Although there are videos all over the internet, of how to download and install Connected Components Workbench, I'm going to breeze through the current format of doing that as of uh, late 2018. It constantly changes. Rev levels change, feature packs change, a lot changes. The way that I would always do it and have done it is I go to Google and I type in CCW now that might get me there, but I could also put in AB, you know, for Alan Bradley, and then hit enter. Well, there you go, right off the bat. 
all over the place. You could connect, click on either one of those first two. I'll just pick the first one because it's the first one up. Now, it just so happens that I am permanently logged in to Rockwell Automation. I didn't get the login. In other words, I, it didn't come up and say I need to log in or sign in. If that's what you get, then you have to create an account. and It's free. Username and a password. There's just no way around that. And you're, you're going to be using stuff off of their site off and on for years. So you might as well just go ahead and create the account. And then you'll get to this page. And on this page, you'll see some marketing information. And you'll see a short, if you want to call it discussion or bulleted point on the current software version level which happens to be 11 and the very first feature pack that ever came out and it came out for version 11 and you can go down here there's some videos that you could watch i don't know how good they are typically rockwell makes their videos more marketing and selling features oriented and not practical but there's always a little information that you can glean look down through your system requirements if you've got an apple laptop or computer you can learn load windows on it personally i like windows 7 pro i've never used 8 i owned a laptop or actually it was a tower with windows 8 for one day <laughs> i hated it took it back and bought another windows 7 pro now i do have a number of windows 10 computers that i use in the classes that i teach and all of my big screen tvs have towers or laptops of some sort and they're Windows 10. So I am forcing myself to uh, get adapt to 64-bit Windows 10. So read through this to make sure you're ready to go. And now here's an important thing. You've got standard and developer. Standard is free. And if you're just getting started by all means download version 11 software standard and have at it. However, if you're serious then I would be considering the developer because there are certain features that you're not going to have to use with the standard. But guarantee you, the standard is good enough to get started and learn what you need to learn. If you mouse over here, you see that's a link and you can download. Now, it, you can't download the developer without paying for it. And that you have to buy from your local Allen Bradley distributor. So if you uh, do a search on Allen Bradley Distributor in your area, call, ask for technical sales, and when they answer, tell them that you want to purchase the developer edition of Connected Components Workbench, and they'll set, set you up and give you a price. I, I bought it. I don't remember how expensive it was, it, but it didn't even give me pause for an instant. And then from there, you're going to download something. And once it's downloaded, then you're going to install it, and then you're going to open the software. Now I'm going to open the software, and I will probably pause once the splash screen comes up, so you don't have to sit here and watch that splash screen open up into the full software. And after a long wait, I even went and made myself another cup of coffee while I was waiting for this to open. I'm sure it didn't take that long, but it took a while. So don't get impatient. This is what popped up. Now, I'm going to, to pull this out so it fills up my space. A lot of what you see here would not appear when you open your software the first time. All of this recent stuff here, none of this is going to show up. Now, I could have went in and kind of emptied this out to give it more of a fresh start look, but why bother? Because before long, you're going to have things down there for recent. And of course, you know what recent is, right? The most recent <laughs> thing that I worked on was video recording one. I don't even know what that was. Um, it was something that I was trying out as an approach to doing the CCW. But nonetheless, you get the idea. And before that, July 8th, 2018, PowerFlex 525. This software, Connected Components Workbench, does much, much more than just programs for the Micro 800 family. It does a bunch of other stuff. We'll point it out a little bit, but we're not going to go off into all the other things that it can do. What we really want to get to is the Micro 800. 
So right now there is no project open. And I'm going to assume that for you, you don't have any recent, so there is no open existing, right? You don't have an existing. Uh, there is discover, but we're going to leave that alone. We're just going to go to new. And uh, I'm going to, I'll make this project one simply because whatever was created before project one, I don't care about it. So I'm going to say create. Okay, it doesn't like that. It's a name already used, so it's complaining. So I'll change it a little bit. Okay, I like that. Project 01. I already had a, you know, right down here, see, I had Project 1 already. So it, what's interesting is it doesn't follow the normal Windows format of coming up and saying, do you want to overwrite an existing file? It just doesn't let you create it. Now that may change. By the time you're watching this video, that could have changed. So what it pops up and says, okay, you want to create a project, you need to add a device. Now you can add devices over here. See the little plus sign? But it's still going to bring up this dialog here. And I have the choice between controllers, drive, safety, and graphic terminal. So I'll start at the bottom and I could do panel view 800s or I could do panel view component. For motor control, I can do soft starters, the, the SMC Flex or the 50 standard. There's some safety devices, safety relays and light curtains. In other words, you can add those to your project and configure them. Now, I don't use these bottom three. I might use the graphic terminal eventually, but typically I do something when I'm doing engineering, I typically am using Factory Talk View ME. I've not had cause to do a graphic terminal in Connected Components Workbench. Let's go to Drives. Okay, and they add more to this list ever so often. Well, the Powerflex 520 and specifically the 525, really nice little drive that supports Ethernet IP and you can buy them new on the internet for between $350 and $500 and you can buy the 115 volt version and you can buy a three phase 230 volt motor from Oriental Motor for about a hundred and a quarter, $125. It's a little 125th horsepower, a little bit bigger round than a beer can and not quite as long and you can actually build yourself a little PowerFlex 525 Variable Frequency Drive Training Station. As a matter of fact, if you go back to my website and go to Live Classroom and View Hardware, you scroll down, you'll see what, how we take and combine a PowerFlex 525, the 115 volt single phase input version, with that little three phase motor. However, today we're not interested in drives, we're only interested in controllers. And right now, currently, there's Micro 810, 820, 830, 850, and 870. The Micro 810 is a world unto itself. And it comes in four flavors. And these four flavors have to do with the I-O interfaces to the field devices, AC, DC, etc. I typically always use the QBB because it gives me the most capability when you get up into the more powerful pr controllers. I'm not going to select one yet. So 820s, three flavors, 830. And actually an 820 QBB is a good choice. However, it does not have a conventional connector for the RS-232. It does have Ethernet. And the 830, it has the conventional RS-232, but it doesn't have the Ethernet. I would avoid the 830. My personal preference would be the 820 with the HMI that costs another couple hundred dollars because that gives you the USB connector and it gives you Ethernet. Otherwise, I would jump to the 850 or 870. And of course, they're more expensive. Well, to write this instant, we're going to pick the LC-10. I select it. 
and you know you can drop down this list and look but if you just acquired yours it's going to be whatever the latest version is most likely we're not going to cover flashing firmware and i happen to know that my 810 i have three of these that i work with i have an 810 an 820 with the HMI and then I have an 870. So I have a broad range of these controllers to work with in developing the manual and the lab projects. Most of them, if not all of them, you can do with the the LC10. But I will say this, with the LC10 you're not going to get online programming. I mean you can change it from run to auto, I mean from run, run and program mode. You can change the mode but you can't edit the code online. The 820 and up you can, but the LC10 you can't. So if, you, if you've not purchased your controller yet, I would seriously consider jumping from the less than $100 LC10 up to a 20 with the HMI on it. When you add the HMI onto the 20, that gives you the standard USB port to plug into. And USB is cool. I like it much better than the standard RS-232 interface. Also notice that there's a plastic cover here on the LC-10. There's a plastic cover here and there's one right here. This LC-10 for $85, $90, whatever it is, does not have an LCD display and this is not a conventional communications connector. You have to spend another $35, $40 for a USB adapter module that you plug in here that you can plug your USB cable in. So for all practical purposes, purposes you might as well say that an LC10 is going to cost you roughly $140 by the time you get the USB adapter. And if you want the little LCD screen, that's another $40, $50. So you're going to be closer to $200 for an LC10 with a little screen and with the USB port. But we're going to go ahead and pick that. See, it gives you the details right here. So I'm going to select it. When I say add to project, what it's going to do, it's going to take the class of objects, 2080-LC10-12QBB. That is a class of data objects. And it's going to create an instance of it and add it to my project. And if you're not fami familiar with information object modeling, information objects, class of objects, instances, it won't kill you to go to YouTube or the net and search a little bit and read. And as soon as you do, you go, oh, yeah, yeah, this is nothing. I understand this. You know, dog, that's a class of objects. German Shepherd, that's an instance of a class of objects. You get it. Now I've created an instance of the information object micro 810 qbb in this case and you can see that's all right here i can under controller this is the general information and i can't i wish i could collapse some of this because i don't need to see this but i want you to see what's down here uh, under memory there's nothing for you to see until you actually build something see memory usage is only updated after a build and then you've got startup interrupts, real-time clock. And under real-time clock, you could set the date and time based on the date and time of your computer, your laptop. Okay? You can go to embedded I.O. and it shows you what you have. And so you've got some analog inputs, but no analog output. You have eight inputs. Okay, so here you have 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And here you can set your filter. It's like a debounce filter. It filters out noise. In other words, it ignores anything that's less than 8 milliseconds. Any change in state. If it doesn't stay for at least 8 milliseconds, 16 milliseconds, 32, etc., it ignores it. It's just a noise filter. Well, these eight inputs, the first four share the electrical interface with possible analog inputs. So you don't have eight inputs and four outputs plus four analog inputs. You've got eight inputs. Four of those could be used as analog. Okay, so that's all you get down here under this. You get, now LCD module, I do have one. 
Okay, so just for grins, I'll attach it. Oh, there it is. So all that I did was took a instance of the class of objects, Micro 810, and I modified it to include a sub instance of the type of object LCD module. And you can do some things with that LCD module. Actually, if you're going to use the 810, you might as well spend the 40 bucks and get the cute little LCD module, but you definitely have to have the USB connector adapter that plugs in here. Okay, so I've created this instance of an LC10 QBB. Now, if I go to programs, notice up here, I got start page. You recognize that, right? That's where we started. And now we've got this new page, Micro 810. I'm going to go to programs and double click. Nothing happens because there aren't any programs. I'm going to go to global variables and double click. And there is something to happen. And that is these are the global variables that come with an instance of a Micro 810. So these are the variables that include all the I.O. See right here? You've got digital output 0, 1, 2, and 3. You've got digital input 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And then you've got analog in. So remember that these four right here share the same electronics as these four right here. You can't have them be both. Now the rest of these are system variables. We're not going to discuss them. I just wanted to give you a quick look-see what the global variables were. There's not going to be any user-defined function blocks and there are no data types because we, well actually there are some data types. I'll bring this into view here. Structures, um, but there's no instances of these. Okay, these are data types. Totally ignore them. And then define words, there are none because you haven't defined any yet. So there are no arrays, there are structures, and there are no defined words. So this is a bare naked Micro 810 project. So there's really nothing here. Now I'm going to, I could close this Micro 810 global variables here, or I can just click on another tab. I'm going to go here, right click and add a ladder diagram program file. There were no program files before. Now see you got program one and you can name that anything you want. You can name it monkey doodles. Okay. Now here's what I want to point out that I pointed out earlier in the lecture. Here are the global variables. There's your IO. Okay. And here is your first program and the local variables of which there aren't any. So this set of variables right here can only be accessed from program one. So program one can read and write to local variables and global variables. If we create a second program, program two, now we have three tag databases. We've got global variables, and they're accessible to program one and program two. And we've got local variables, but inside of program one. So program one can work with these or the global global variables. Program two can work with its local variables and the global variables. But program two cannot see or touch these local variables part of program one and vice versa. Program one cannot access or do anything with these local variables. Okay, that's a micro 810. And I think I'm going to, this lecture's gotten long enough, so I think I'm going to start another one and talk about other microcontrollers, micro 800 controllers beyond the 810, just in case you're starting there. We're going to continue this discussion in the next video.